Hello and welcome to Aspects of Japanese Studies. I am Junko Habu, the chair of the Center for Japanese Studies, or CJS, and I'm, host, I'm the host of today's show. Aspect of Japanese Studies is a talk series that showcases the research being conducted by faculty, graduate students, and alumni of the CJS. Each speaker will present a casual talk on her or his ongoing project or key research topics in the field of Japanese studies. We'll be doing a short Q&A session after the talk. And for those of you who are joining us live today, you can submit questions at any point during the talk using the chat function. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Marge Birch, a CJS alumni and assistant professor of Japanese studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. Marge received her PhD in 2018 from the Department of East Asian Languages and Culture at UC Berkeley. And her dissertation title was um, Ins Inscriptive Life and the Sinographic Literary Culture in Early Historic Korea and Japan. Marge is fluent in both Japanese and Korean. And uh, um, I was on her committee as an external member, and she wrote the majority of her dissertation in my lab. Her supervisor was Professor Mark Horton and uh, he's joining us today, and I want him to say a few words about Margin's work. Mac? On, Mac? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great, can everybody else? I, I can only see a few people here um, above. Hey, Margie, nice to see you again. Um, well, we have 52 people uh, already on the screen. This is a webinar, so that's why. Right, right. No, I can see just a few people. But <laughs> I just wanted to say that the importance of Margie's research really can't be overestimated. It deals with, uh, as Jugo already pointed out, the influx into Yamato, Japan, of elites from the Korean Peninsula in the 7th century, before and after as well, who profoundly shaped Yamato uh, culture. And far from being second-class citizens, as we sometimes now unfairly are tempted to think of immigrants as, uh, these alaktons, as, as Herman Ohms calls them, were uh, vitally important in introducing into Japan many of the most, uh, many of the central elements of statecraft, law, philosophy, religion, and literature. And Margie is particularly interested in the last. One of the best examples of uh, this kind of person, uh, one of the examples that I think everybody knows, is Yamata, uh, Yamanoe no Okura. Uh, he apparently arrived in Japan as a child from Pekche and composed some of the most important poetry in Mayoshu, the famous dialogue between poverty and destitution or verses in old age. Margie focuses in her research on uh, what Sheldon Pollock calls literization and the process through which a culture comes to grips with uh, written language. In Japan's case, this of course involves the process through which Chinese orthography was applied to Japanese vernacular through the influence of Korean. And this is a topic that is extremely current. Uh, I was interested just yesterday uh, to notice on the web that uh, Alex Vovin's paper has been circulated, just circulating right now, on the debt of Japanese kana to uh, a similar Korean system, uh, kwokyeol, if you'll forgive my pronunciation. Uh, particularly important in Margie's case have been the, the thousands of wooden slips, the mokkang, that are still being uh, newly discovered in troves. Uh, they're, they're fascinating. And she'll talk about more of that today. Now that the scars of Japan's colonial legacy are healing, uh, Japanese and Korean scholars born in the post-war era in particular are, I think, bringing a new objectivity and cooperation to the study of the ancient concourse between their nations. And Margie has been a very important part of this multilingual conversation. 
I call her Margie. I should be calling her Professor Burge at this point, but after a decade here, it's very hard to do. She entered our graduate program in EALC in order to study Japanese literature, notably Man Yoshu. But in the course of her study, it became clearer and clearer to her that uh, this couldn't be done without a study of Korean analogs. So she set out with her customary uh, courage and work ethic and energy to learn Korean. And she reached the point where she now gives uh, learned papers in Korea in Korean. And she even interpreted between Japanese and Korean scholars at a conference here at Berkeley some years ago. Recently, she spent six months at the Nara National Institute for Korean uh, for Cultural Properties, gathering data. Not surprisingly, she was a superlative student here. I learned a lot from her papers, one on Shinsei Man Yoshu, which I'm glad to see she's going to continue to uh, develop into uh, a, a research topic later. And also she wrote on the, a comparison between the Confessions of Lady Nijo, Tuazgatari, in a work by a Korean princess, uh, Han Jun Mok. Her master's uh, thesis was under the same moon, early vernacular poetry of Sheila and Japan. It draws parallels, very courageous parallels, between Man Yoshu and Hyanga poems uh, in, in a way that's never before been attempted. After completing her dissertation, she went on to a prestigious postdoc University of Chicago, and as Junko pointed out, is now a tenure track faculty member at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And so I look forward today to hearing more about Mokgan and how they've influenced our understanding of the culture of the Omi court. Thank you, Margie. Thank you, Mac. So as Mac pointed out, Marge is a new generation of an international and uh, interdisciplinary scholar. And I'm very excited that she's doing a work that um, is right on the intersection of archeology, span literature, uh, history, and many more. So her title um, today is Reimagining the Lost Written Culture of the Omi Capital, Insights from Mokan. Please welcome Marge. I'm, I'm, I'm not muted, right? I just got a weird notification. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so, so much um, for having me. Thank you, Professor Habu, for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Horton, for your very kind introduction. Um, I'm so um, happy and honored to be back at Berkeley. Um, also, a very sincere thank you to, to Kumi and, and Tessa for um, putting this event together. Um, so what I'm going to present on today, I think uh, Professor Horton kind of very nicely gave us a lot of the context for, um, but it is part of my larger work that looks at the early written cultures of the Korean Peninsula and the Japanese archipelago, spanning roughly the 6th through the 8th centuries. Um, I'm sorry, I have not started sharing my screen. <laughs> Let me do that. Um, so, um, I'm particularly interested in exploring the connections between these written cultures, um, as Professor Orton noted. And as I hope to show today, I think the Omi capital in the larger Omi region in the seventh century offers one of the clearest cases for thinking about concrete connections between peninsular written culture and that of Japan. So the Omi capital, uh, it lasted only five years, 667 to 672, a single reign, that of the sovereign known posthumously as Tenchi. And many of you not very familiar with ancient Japan may have never even heard of it. So why is it important? Uh, my focus on this particular moment in time um, was partly provoked by um, what uh, eighth century texts do in looking back to the time of the Omi capital as a time of emergent literary culture. So for instance, the Kaifuso, which is a mid eighth century um, work of uh, a collection of literary synetic verse produced in Japan, the preface uh, talks about the Omi court in this way. And I know this looks like a big block of text, but try just to focus on the red parts. That's what I'm going to focus on here. So we're told um, that Tenchi was a wise sovereign who recognized that nothing could be more revered than writing for transforming the vulgar. Um, he established an academy where he summoned those of great talent to teach, and he invited men of letters um, with whom he would uh, hold banquets where they would drink wine and compose poetry together. Um, and 
just exactly who these men of great talent and men of letters were is something I want to get into a little bit in this presentation. They are, the short answer is there are these alloctons that um, Professor Horton uh, introduced for us. Um, but um, I'm going to bookmark that for a moment and just note that the Manyoshu, um, which you are probably all mostly familiar with, the um, eighth century collection of vernacular verse, also has kind of a, a similar way of presenting Tenchi's court as one where um, composition of literary Sinitic verse was, was valued and engaged in frequently. So here in this um, preface to the, um, or the head note to the famous um, poem by Nukata no Okimi, where she compares the spring mountains and the autumn mountains, we have Tenchi asking Fuja, Fujiwara no Kamatari to compose a verse in literary Sinitic on a very conventional topic of the merits of spring versus autumn. So both of these eighth century texts um, look back to the Omi capital um, from a remove of about three or four generations. Um, and they look at it upon it as an important moment in the history of writing and literature. And the Kaifuso even more or less looks at looks to it as an origin of literary culture in Japan. And unfortunately, oh sorry, I should just return briefly to this slide. Um, the intricate stanzas and beautiful lines that the Kaifuso talks about here that supposedly were composed in myriad number at, um, at the Omi court. None of these uh, are extant. Um, they were probably not extant in the eighth century because of uh, what followed in uh, at the end of the Omi uh, court period, the succession struggle um, of 672 known as the Jinxin War, uh, when much of this was probably destroyed. Um, so what can we know about the written culture of the capital of Omi beyond what the Kaifuso and the Mayoshu say? Well, today um, I'm going to briefly introduce what we know about the Omi capital um, from both historical and archaeological sources in order to contextualize the evidence that we now have in the form of mokkan or inscribed wooden slips um, that can tell us something about what that written culture might have looked like, who was writing, and what sort of texts were being consumed and produced. So allow me to introduce the Omi capital now. Um, the uh... The Omi capital is sort of different from a lot of other ancient Japanese capitals. Well, it is different, um, primarily because it is located at modern Otsu, uh, which is in Shiga prefecture on the shores of Lake Biwa, very far from the traditional Kinai region, the home provinces um, of you know, the Yamato Basin. Um, so why did Tenchi bother to move the court two days travel north to the province of Omi in 667? The Nihon Shoki's entry on the move to Omi here on this slide um, is fairly brief. Um, it just says the capital was removed to Omi on the 19th day of the third month of the sixth year of um, Tenchi's reign. And the new capital uh, was located at um, what is now the Nishikori district of Otsu City in Shiga Prefecture. And the location is this down here, um, you know, I've used a map of Lake Biwa here to kind of show where it is um, uh, in terms of the, the lake, this southwestern tip of Lake Biwa, just over Mount Hiei from modern Kyoto. Of course, there's no Kyoto at the time, um, but it is a very quick ride on the JR line from Kyoto Station to Otsu today. Um, so the capital may have moved uh, here um, to Otsu in 667, but this move was probably um, in the works for at least four years prior to that. Um, and it was, as Nihon Shoki goes on to tell us after that brief um, entry I just cited, um, an unpopular and a difficult move to make. Um, obviously, had to move the entire court that far um, could not have but been difficult. So the question is then why? Um, and this is something that scholars have debated endlessly, um, but some of the most frequently cited answers I've included on this slide here, um, you know, first that there was an effort on Tenchi's part to escape the entrenched powers of the Yamato region. Um, Second, to place the capital somewhere more easily defensible in the face of a possible invasion from the continent, namely Tang China, um, after Japan was defeated in the Battle of the Peck River, and more on that in a moment, um, and to better facilitate communication with the eastern provinces and Koguryo on the Korean Peninsula. And this third point I won't really be able to get into today, um, but feel free to ask about it if you're interested. So out of these, number two is by far the most commonly cited reason and 
but I think that all of these do have some role to play. Um, but with regard to number one um, and Tenchi's selection of Omi in particular, I think there is um, room to talk about here that his interest in seeking new allies in the Omi region, particularly among newly arrived Pekjai refugees and Pekjai descendant groups who were already resident in Omi. Allow me to briefly elaborate on this. Um, Otsu, um, or the Omi capital, um, this vicinity was traditionally home to a number of immigrant populations who were originally from the Korean Peninsula, starting from about the beginning of the 6th century. Um, there is a large Kokun era settlement site located just south of the Otsu Palace uh, ruins, which is in Nishikori, as I mentioned. Um, and this site features uh, a number of enclosed pillar buildings, um, which are typical of uh, immigrant construction. Um, some of these buildings even have ondol floor heating systems, which is fascinating fascinating and fairly rare um, in Japan. Um, pottery found at the site is largely identifiable with that from Pekje, and the larger area um, features around 700 domed uh, stone chamber tombs uh, with burial goods um, that are primarily associated with immigrant populations. Um, the early part of the 7th century in this area also sees the construction of at least three lineage temples, um, and the material remains of these temples all suggest that the temples continue to have contact with the, with the peninsula. So um, it is thought that the people who settled in the Omi region in the early 6th century probably had immigrated um, during an, a period of political turmoil and military conflict on the peninsula um, in the late 5th century. And then after 663 and the Battle of the Peck River, um, to their ranks were added refugees of more recent origin. And in particular, these people had fled along with a defeated Yamato military force that had gone um, to Pekje uh, or former Pekje territory to restore Pekje in 663 after it had already fallen to an allied Tangshila force in 660. Um, so the Nihon Shoki notes that Tenshi's uh, was not necessarily busy, but he was frequently settling uh, people uh, of uh, who had come uh, with that defeated force from Pekje in the Omi region between 663 and 667. Um, so a number of these same refugees are also noted in the Nihon Shoki as having been enlisted to build peninsula style walled fortresses along the inland sea on the route that an invasion force would have to come um, from continental East Asia to the capital. Um, so moving the capital then further inland um, to Omi uh, and the shore of Lake Biwa was almost certainly a part of this new defensive strategy. But as I mentioned, is also a place where Tenchi could effectively make use of the skills and knowledge of both newly arrived refugees who he had settled there and long settled immigrant, uh, the long settled Im immigrant population that was already there. So in moving the capital to Omi, I argue, Tenchi was seeking to balance the boo of this defensive strategy with some boon as well. He was looking to use the literate labor, if you'll allow that term, of Pekje descendant individuals in Omi to create a document-based bureaucratic government um, and a literarily proficient court that could be recognized as civilized by Chinese standards. Um, Tenchi was concerned with both um, military and cultural defense strategies, in other words, um, in the face of the Tang threat. So what resulted um, was a short-lived um, but very fascinating, I think, bilingual, bicultural court, uh, which was essentially a site of Pekje Yamato immigration for that five year, uh, inter integration for that five year period. And this integration is even noted uh, within the Nihon Shoki, which uh, claims that this was a popular song from the period, uh, which reads, Tachibana wa ono ga eda eda narere domo tama ni nuku toki onaji oni nuku. Right? And, um, my translation here, the oranges, each on their own branches, they ripen, but when they are strung as beads, they're all on the same cord. So the tachibana or oranges are, of course, officials of Pekje and Yamato background who have ripened separately on their own branches, but are now on the same cord in service of the sovereign. Uh, so 
Beyond this verse, though, um, what evidence is there for what I've just laid out, that the court culture at Olmi was bicultural and bilingual? Well, I believe that we can now look to Mokan, found within both the bounds of Otsu and outside it in the larger Olmi region, that can offer some perspective. So briefly, um, some numbers on um, Olmi and, and Mokan, um, we have a total of uh, 39 Mokan that date from the seventh century from Omi. Uh, from Otsu itself, we actually only have two. And I'm going to talk about these both in detail in a moment. Um, unfortunately also, we cannot be 100% certain that those two definitively date to that five-year period because neither of them has a date on them. That would be the only way to know for sure. Um, but there is um, some, um, <laughs> possibility that that is the case. And certainly um, another thing I want to emphasize here is continuity between written culture in Omi, both pre, during, and post Omi capital. Um, now, in addition to these two, we also have 37 Mokan, which have been recovered from sites on the eastern shore of Lake Biwa, the largest number of which are in Yasu City. And you can see, um, I, I think I can use my cursor here, um, on the map here. And there's a large cluster of sites there in Yasu. Um, this may look like a small number of sites and even an even smaller number of artifacts, but let me assure you that this is only the case when compared to the large caches of Mokan that we know from 8th century sites. In fact, this crop of Mokan from Olmi is the second largest number of Mokan from any provincial site grouping for the 7th century. Um, and this suggests that Olmi was indeed one of the more literate places in late 7th century Japan. So um, let me begin uh, my discussion of a few examples here um, with two, the two that come from Otsu itself. Um, first, the Minami Shiga site Mokan, and there's not a terrible, uh, terrible large amount of things to say about this uh, because a good amount of the inscription is illegible, um, but we know from the shape that it was, uh, it seems to have been a tag or a label, although the content, what we can read does suggest something more of an account register almost. Um, the reason that I bring it up here um, is because I think it's interesting to note the occur occurrence not once but twice of the Kabane Osa, which it means translator. And these were literally, um, you know, people whose role it was to translate and interpret for for the sovereign, for the court. Um, and I think it fits very, uh, it, it's an interesting um, thing to find in a place like Otsu that I've just described that is noted for having had such a large concentration of newly arrived refugees from the peninsula. Um, it's not the most frequently occurring title or, or kabane, it's a family title. Um, you don't really see this popping up all that much on um, Mokan um, from later capitals, from later eras. So I think it is significant that we see it here. But there's a lot more to say about the other Mokan from Otsu, which is popularly known as the Ongi Mokan or the Glossary Mokan. Um, it's recovered from uh, the Kita Otsu site, uh, which is where the JR Otsu Kyo station now stands. Um, and it's just south of Nishikori, the palace ruins, and thought to have been the southern boundary of the administrative area of the palace. Um, it's quite interesting here, and I think I need to be able to move this to use my cursor. Um, but you see these larger sinographs that are then glossed um, in phonograms in two columns here. So this character, for instance, is being glossed as Ku Ha Shi. And I should say this image on the right is actually a replica. Um, the image on the left is the original, but the replica makes it much easier to see the character. So I will be um, using that um, to uh, read out here. And here we have a variant form of the, of the character Karada, which is being glossed as Tsuku Ra Hu. Um, and, and so on. We also have some characters that are not being glossed in phonograms, but rather we're given a synonym. So this character, we're told the synonym is, is Kai here. This character is Sai, we're told the synonym is Shu Toru. Um, so there's also some of that going on. So it's hard to necessarily point to this and say um, it's a character dictionary, but, and not only because um, not everything is being glossed with phonograms, we're given synonyms in some cases, but because we also have um, 
uh, highly contextual readings, right? Your first uh, reading that you're going to go to for this character is not going to be tsukurau, a verb, which would mean to dawn, right? It's probably going to be karada, right? Uh, a noun. Um, so, and then we also have this character here being glossed as azamu kamu yamo, um, which, um, <laughs> You know that that's obviously a, a um, you've got an auxiliary mu there. You've got uh, ending particle yamo, which is a, a hangover counterfactual, so it would translate to something like "Could he be fooled? No, he couldn't." Um, that sort of thing is it's not a dictionary entry, right? It's not telling you how to read this character in any context. It's highly contextual, so this is probably something more of a guide to reading a specific text. But not only that. Um, which I think, you know, in, in general, overall, this says something interesting about what's going on in terms of reading practices at Olmi. Um, but we also have the use of certain phonograms like this one here for ya, um, it's the character Utsusu. Um, that, that reading ya for that is not uh, unknown in Japan, but it's not the most common reading. Um, we also have azamu kamu yamo, when we should expect azamu kame yamo, uh, according to 8th century grammar, it should be izenke, not sh uh, shusuke, that these little elements here suggest that this could have been something um, written by a second language learner. In other words, that what we might have here, um, and there's I think compelling evidence here, particularly with the use of this phonogram for ya, um, that this may have been a text produced by a Peck J person learning how to read and gloss a text into Japanese. Um, and I think this is not inconsistent again with the translators that we just saw on the previous mokka. So I know we're short on time, so I'm just going to briefly talk about a couple examples that come from outside of Otsu, um, from the um, Yasu sites, uh, the Nishikawa site group in Yasu. This one is a very famous example where um, basically the text is written in a logographic shorthand um, that it, you know it's obviously meant to be glossed into the vernacular. And the interesting thing about this particular style of logographic shorthand is there are very similar inscriptions on Shilamukan. Um, and I think that, you know, without getting into too much more detail here, to, to find this, um, and this mokan probably dates to the 670s or, or early 680s, um, to find this in Omi uh, from the late 7th century is a suggestion of kind of the importance of again, peninsular immigrants and bringing written culture to Japan. And the fact that Omi was so heavily settled by people with peninsular roots, I think, again, um, it helps to account for why we have uh, inscription styles like this found in Omi in particular. And the second example, um, which I will um, not really go into much detail here either, is seems to have been kept for a quite a period. It has a sexagenary date that corresponds to 676. Seems to have been kept for a fairly long time though. It was found among artifacts um, that mostly dated from the eighth century and probably uh, served as sort of a uh, example or a memorable example of, of writing. Um, that uh, you know, people would uh, use and emulate. And it suggests that there was emphasis not only on growing literacy, but a focus on writing of quality. And this text is also, uh, is, um, you know, compared to the previous one in a relatively standard literary synodic. So just to wrap up here, I admittedly, the evidence that I've presented is fairly limited, but I think that the mokan um, that I've cited here um, can help to uh, shed some light on this tanka and what this tanka may have meant in practice. Um, what did it mean that they had um, you know, grown on their own branches and are now strung on the same cord? Um, well, what I want to suggest here is to say that the written culture of the Omi capital was one in which that of the former kingdom of Pekje was being integrated with and forming the foundation for a new Yamato literary culture. And those men of talent um, that Tenchi had summoned to him to propagate the classics and compose verse with him at court banquets, those were probably um, to a large extent literate Pekje refugees. And it was these same men who would also train the first truly literate generation in Japan. So I'm going to um, leave it there. Um, and I recognize um, that we are sort of out of time, but I hope there may be a few minutes for questions. <laughs>